we must refer to the dog lover Arkwright for the history of the pointer. English hunters of the 1700s, the time when the pointer starts to have a physiognomy of its own, did not possess a true pointer. But with skilled crossing and intelligent selection, they transformed an existing pointer that came from the continent. According to some people, this was originally from Spain, and Arkwright affirms their contribution in creating the pointer and the hounds in the kennels of the kings of France, Louis XIV and XV, which in turn came from the Italian courts. Other British researchers claim that the breed came from the Portuguese hounds that were imported in England by a Portuguese dealer. The Spanish origin of the pointer, however, seems more probable, and this is Arkwright's own view, as written in his famous essay, even if certainly blood was supplied by the French and Italian hounds. It seems the first short-haired pointers were exported from Spain to England after the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 by some English officers interested in the breed. It was characterized by a solid color coat like those already bred and written about by Arkwright that went under the name of Skandal. After this period, however, something happened that made Arkwright furious, but had, in fact, an unexpectedly successful consequence. Colonel Thornton crossed the pointer with the foxhound from which the famous Dash was born. Dash was in fact the offspring of a pointer bitch and of a foxhound dog. Just for the record, this dog was considered a great champion of wide searches, and the speed of its gallop also had a sense of the wild and pointed to grey partridges in an exceptional way. It was sold by Colonel Thornton to Sir Richard Simmons for the equivalent of 160 pounds of champagne, 238 litres of light wine, a handsome rifle and another pointer, with the clause that if by chance it was not good at hunting, it was to be returned to the Colonel for 50 guineas. Dash, in fact, broke a leg and he was returned to Colonel Thornton and was used in breeding, but with very bad results. This crossbreed was not abandoned and other breeders carried on, so that the modern pointer can be said to be one of the same bloodline. The most notable result of this crossbreeding was the change of the coat from solid colour to the white with black, orange and lemon markings. Another great breeder who favoured crossbreeding with the foxhound was Eidstone, late 1800s. He wrote, The best cross seems to have been with the foxhound because it has given speed, courage, power and perseverance, with the disadvantage, however, of being difficult to train at pointing. Thanks to Drake's writings, we know that there were numerous extremely fast pointers capable of reaching a speed of 60 kilometers an hour. Other authors have mentioned different breeds that have contributed to the formation of the pointer. Whatever the truth, the contribution of the English breeders is unquestionable and they successfully changed the breed, now considered a true work of art. In Italy, the pointer has always had a large number of admirers and is the most widely bred gun dog and was the most common gun dog and trial dog until the 1950s. After that, the popularity of the pointer began to decline. However, we can still say that dogs are still being raised that trace the true spirit of the breed in their work and every year there are a number of supreme champions in the categories best of breed trial and working dog. Nowadays, although the number of breeders working with the pointer has declined, there are still those who are devoted to this canine masterpiece, which takes part in the most prestigious dog shows in Europe. The dog belongs to the Bracoid group, a short-haired rectilinear breed, a hunting dog of English origin. General 
characteristics. The general norms are that of a middle-sized dog with the trunk in balance. Height at the withers is equal to the length of the trunk. The height at the withers in the dogs is 55 to 62 centimeters and 54 to 60 centimeters in the bitches. The weight ranges from 20 to 30 kilograms. The head looks as though it is sculpted in marble, heavily chiselled with strong features and expresses fire, energy, intelligence, will and a lively temperament. The head is always carried into the wind. It has sparkling eyes and fine lines with an expression very different to a braco. It is dolicocephalic, i.e. the length is four-tenths the height at the withers, while the length of the muzzle is half the total length of the head. The width of the skull must be less than half of the total length of the head, so that the cephalic index does not exceed 45. The directions of the upper longitudinal planes of the skull and of the muzzle converge. There must not be any wrinkles on the head and the skin must be close-fitting, sleek and tight. On the head, the skill must seem lean. The nose seen in profile is slightly raised above the line of the muzzle. In the white pointer, the pigmentation must be that of the marks, but darker than the coat. In the orange colour, the mucous membranes and the bony structures can be flesh-coloured and not black. Its nose bridge must be in a straight line. The upper lip, seen from in front, makes a semicircle where it joins. The upper part of the muzzle is well-developed and high. The profile of the underside of the muzzle, seen from in front and underneath, looks like a semicircle drawn up by a cord. The lip commissure must be accentuated and the mucous membranes visible. The lips must be of a fine texture, thin, light, but not dangling or too relaxed. The eye sockets must be well chiselled and be in prominent relief, showing the tight skin, minimal subcutaneous tissue and weak development of the muscles. The sides of the muzzle are parallel, and so the upper face of the muzzle is square. The jaws must be normal and with perfectly fitted teeth arched so that the incisors of the upper jaw are perfectly opposite to the lower incisors. The nose groove is quite marked and the frontal bone falls perpendicularly to the joint of the nasal bone and the maxillary bone. The front cranium is very developed, accenting the nasal depression. The length of the skull must be equal to the length of the muzzle and the zygomatic arches must be less than half of the total length of the head. The sides of the skull are flat. The foreface must be developed with joins in the middle at the front with a good bone structure. The occiput must be clean and prominent without being exaggerated but it must however be visible. Ears. The ears must be pendant, soft, thin, flexible, triangular and lie flat in a way that clings in all its widths to the cheek and to the parotid region. Their base is wide and is inserted at the top of the zygomatic arch. The apex of the ear must end in a rather narrow tip. The cartilage, thin and covered with a lot of fine skin, does not fold back on itself and remains visible. Neck. The length of the neck is equal to the length of the head. The joint with the head must make a clean break with the nape. The upper profile makes an arch that begins right after the joining of the nape and goes on toward the joining of the withers. The throat must be completely free of ridges. Four quarters. The shoulders must be long and slanted when the dog is at rest. The shoulder blades must be very close together. The tops of the shoulder blades must not be more than 1.5 centimeters apart. The elbows must be closed and not too close to the walls of the rib cage, but neither too open, turned outwards. The foot must be of an oval form, hare foot, with curved tight toes covered with fine short hair. The pads are hard, fleshy and dry, and the bony structures are pigmented. 
The toenails must be strong, curved and pigmented. The body. It has already been said that the body, measured from the top of the shoulder to the top of the croup, is equal to the height at the withers. The chest is wide with well-developed pectoral muscles. The bracket of the sternum must remain level with the peak of the shoulder blades. The ribs must be ample, rising up to the elbow, also slightly underneath, sunken, convex, to half of its height. The sternum is long and its profile makes a corded semicircle that joins towards the abdomen. The withers are elevated and in line with the back and narrow where they come together between the top of the shoulder blades. The upper profile of the back is straight. The loins join with the line of the back with wide, well-developed muscles. The lower profile of the lean abdomen joins high up towards the sides and is not exaggerated. The rump must be wide, strong and muscular. It is inclined about 10 degrees to the horizontal and for this the rump of the pointer is called horizontal. The tail is on the same line as the rump, thick and strong at the root, gradually tapering towards the peak that must be fine and thin. Its length must not go beyond the height of the front limb to the elbow or better it must not exceed 53% of the height of the withers. The tail is carried rigid like a pump handle and very curved. Hindquarters. The thighs must be long, wide and covered with lean muscles, the croup well pronounced. The leg bones are strong and covered with lean muscles also on the upper part. The grooving is well pronounced and clear with the safena evident. It is inclined about 38 degrees to the horizontal. Feet are less oval than the front, but with the same requisites. Coat. The hair of the pointer is glossy, no feathering. The maximum length of the hair is one centimeter. Usual colors are lemon and white, orange and white, liver and white, and black and white. Self colors and tri colors are also correct. The pigment of the mucous membranes and of the bony structures must be black or brown and similar to the coat. Faults. It is considered a defect if the dog strayed too far from this standard. It may be more or less serious and end in disqualification. At any time, in show, when a part of the body is given a fail, typically noted as a zero, the dog in examination cannot be taken into consideration, disqualified, even if other marks are excellent. The standard is very concise, and in the chapter relating to the gait, it only says, hunts at a fast gallop. There are no other ways of hunting for a pointer than rushing off at high speed with their head held high. This is reserved for the wide open hills or plains. Solaro affirms that the pointer is the ideal dog for the great expansive lowland, where it may develop its gallop. In the woods, it cannot release its impetuous action and therefore is not adapted to covered terrain. We take up at this stage the standard of this breed as drawn up by John Shepherd in 1937 at the Dog Federation Congress of Paris, still used today. The gait is an impetuous gallop, long, fast and with a tendency to a constant rhythm and rectilinear direction. It covers a lot of ground in quartering and seen in profile the trunk oscillates slightly about an imaginary point center of the figure that remains nearly equal in distance from the trunk using all the impulse of the muscles in the translation. Ease and elegance at the same time as exceptional power are showing an inexhaustible resistance. The top line is straight. The loins arch downwards and are sprung like a rubber band while the hind legs stretch out behind to the maximum in a powerful bucking. The head and nose are carried high and proud. The ears vibrate but do not flap around above the skull. 
One could say that all these attributes are designed for only one purpose, to gallop. More like a headlong rush than a surge, so much is the trust in its sense of smell. The nose into the wind for optimum conditions. Let us look at a few details. The tail is carried in line with the loins, but not higher than the rectilinear bucking. It only moves slightly up and down, but this cannot be checked when it stops, as it is like an immovable rudder. The pointer's course is a series of zigzags. It quickly quarters a large area of the ground. Picking up a light scent, it changes the search toward the presumed origin of smell, sometimes crossing back with a definite point, but without slowing its gallop. When it realizes that the scent is from hidden game, it sets off decisively in a straight line, in sword thrusts, alternating the gallop and the trot, or with tentative steps and galloping until suddenly it stops, as if it had to run into the barrier of the scent, and it stands still. Frozen, statuary, outstretched neck in line with the head, nose horizontal, nostrils dilated, eyes fixed, demonic, Ears erect and muscles taut, one front leg lifted and a hind leg nearly forgotten at the back, as if in mid-stride. Sometimes the body trembles visibly at the tip of the rigid tail, tight or slightly arched on top. And it stays like this, immobile, with an expression of inexorable certainty. When it goes into a strongly scented area, it always goes off in stops and starts, then begins the sword thrusts until it freezes into the final point. If it finds itself suddenly behind the game, it stops suddenly with its head pointed toward the hiding place of the game. Sometimes it completes a turn of 180 degrees in the air and it lands as it is, freezing while still in the air and stays like that. When the game tries to escape, it shows this by bringing the nose higher than the horizon. Then it sets off jumping and stopping again suddenly and continues like this until the end of the drive. The actions described correspond to optimal conditions of environment and of game, but it must be remembered that failing these, the results will be proportionally reduced. When two dogs are working together, the second will stop with the head erect and tall to look at its companion, who has gone into point. If the stop is sudden or the dog on the game is far away, it may make short, restless runs. Before starting training for retrieve, it is essential for the puppy to have learned recall well. By nature, the dog is already a gregarious animal and tends not to stray too far from its master. However, sometimes, caught up in the enthusiasm of a cast, it runs out of sight or, as hunters say, gets out of hand. It should therefore be accustomed to come when called as soon as possible. The recall consists of a clear, piercing whistle, since dogs can hear high frequencies best. In order to train it, take the puppy outside, but in a fenced area. While it is playing and exploring the ground at a short distance from you, crouch down and whistle, and at the same time, dangle a piece of meat or equivalent tidbit. The whistle will immediately attract the dog's attention, and it will turn to look at you out of curiosity. The sight of you crouching will induce the dog to come towards you. As it gets near, it will pick up the smell of the titbit and it will come to you without delay. Once the whistle reward connection is established, it will be sufficient to repeat the exercise while increasing the distance between you and the dog. And the dog will soon come when called, even without the titbit. Next, the dog should be taught to retrieve. Puppies gladly play with sticks or with a small ball that is thrown for them, but often as they grow older, they gradually lose interest in this pastime, if not rewarded. Teaching the dog the retrieve is easy and fun. Shake a small ball, or better still a knotted handkerchief, before the puppy, and once it's really excited, toss the object a couple of meters. While the puppy throws itself headlong onto the object, crouch and wave the usual tidbit, and as soon as the dog has picked up the object, recall it with a whistle. 
puppies that already know the recall will return at once. Too interested in the reward to remember to chew the object, which they will drop in order to take the tidbit. The game must be repeated many more times, gradually increasing the distance, but being careful not to bore the dog. After a few lessons, it will bring the object back without a reward. Once the puppy has completely learnt the visual retrieve, it can be taught to retrieve by nose, by throwing the ball into tall grass, where the animal will be forced to use its sense of smell to find it. The orders used are fetch and give. When they retrieve, certain dogs show the failing of chewing the game, others eat it and some bury it. Such behaviour is nearly always the result of incorrect training. To correct the first, some suggest stuffing the fake game with sharp points. But apart from being cruel, this method has a disadvantage of putting the dog off retrieving forever. The fact is that the dogs with a hard bite are usually the result of bad preparation. If they have been used to carrying large heavy objects, it is natural that they will have learned to tighten their jaws in order to avoid letting the object fall. The ideal teaching aid is a piece of sponge covered in wing feathers. When the puppy grabs this fake game bird between its teeth, it will feel it and loosen its bite. Other reasons for this bad habit may be a bad relationship with its master, an excessively predatory nature or even hunger. After the hunt, if the more the dog is not fed, it will be forced to manage for itself, eating the game instead of retrieving it. It is also important to teach in steps, initially holding one dog on the leash while the other is stopping the game, subsequently letting it off the leash with the command to stay at heel. The pointer is a perfect gun dog, ideal for hunting in areas with game birds on the ground in low vegetation. Partridge and woodcock are favourite prey on the ground and it will go after snipe in the marshes. A superb tracker, it is valid help on all terrain, picking up the slightest scent and freezing in a point to indicate the position of the game to the hunter. The old school of experienced hunters say that nothing can beat a pointer. Though the pointer has inherited trial instincts, it is brave and intrepid and will not stop at brambles or marshes. It is particularly efficient in wide tracking over fields and open countryside, where English hunters didn't use it, perhaps in order to maintain its talent for freezing and pointing, not as a retriever. Even Arkwright writes that in such work, after his pointers stopped, he used small spaniels for this work. Then, as if ashamed, declared he had the purest pointers that were the best retrievers ever seen. If a pointer does not retrieve, it is only because it has not been taught with clarity and constancy. And if there is a difference between English and continental dogs, inasmuch as the latter retrieve almost instinctively, this is probably only due to the fact that they have been fully trained. There have been many pointers who have performed difficult retrieves of pheasants tracked for hundreds of metres from where they fell, and they have even brought ducks from the water that would have been lost without the help of a good rescuer. Lastly, pointers are continually placed even in the San Uberto competition, where the retrieve is one of the most important classes. In the hunting trials, or similar competitions, this marvellous breed has no rivals. This kind of trial, specially designed to show off the English breeds, above all the pointer, would be useless if it were not for the pointer's greatest rival, the English setter. Since the latter is all-purpose and compliant, it can adapt to these practical trials. The pointer was bred to gallop swiftly across wide open spaces and cannot adapt its technique without altering its disposition. The true pointer has no half measures. He is a born trial dog. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. 
This is a serious mistake, since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from three to eight hours. Then the food passes into the intestine, where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is, proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins, and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet, which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treaties, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes, which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders, depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fiber, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A buildup of vitamins can be harmful, and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements, and if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Efficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies, also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. 
there is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will, however, be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty, taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. 
Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrophilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. 
The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filaria is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito. It seems the first short-haired pointers were exported from Spain to England after the Treaty of Utrecht in 1713 by some English officers interested in the breed. It was characterized by a solid color coat like those already bred and written about by Arkwright that went under the name of Skandal. After this period, however, something happened that made Arkwright furious, but had, in fact, an unexpectedly successful consequence. Colonel Thornton crossed the pointer with the foxhound, from which the famous Dash was born. Dash was, in fact, the offspring of a pointer bitch and of a foxhound dog. Just for the record, this dog was considered a great champion of wide searches and the speed of its gallop also had a sense of the wild and pointed to grey partridges in an exceptional way. It was sold by Colonel Thornton to Sir Richard Simmons for the equivalent of 160 pounds of champagne, 238 litres of light wine, a handsome rifle and another pointer with the clause that if by chance it was not good at hunting, Thanks to Drake's writings, we know that there were numerous extremely fast pointers capable of reaching a speed of 60 kilometers an hour. Other authors have mentioned different breeds that have contributed to the formation of the pointer. Whatever the truth, the contribution of the English breeders is unquestionable and they successfully changed the breed, now considered a true work of art. In Italy, the pointer has always had a large number of admirers and is the most widely bred gun dog and was the most common gun dog and trial dog until the 1950s. After that, the popularity of the pointer began to decline. However, we can still say that dogs are still being raised that trace the true spirit of the breed in their work and every year there are a number of supreme champions in the categories best of breed trial and working dog. Nowadays, although the number of breeders working with the pointer has declined, there are still it was to be returned to the colonel for 50 guineas. Dash, in fact, broke a leg and he was returned to Colonel Thornton and was used in breeding but with very bad results. This crossbreed was not abandoned and other breeders carried on so that the modern pointer can be said to be one of the same bloodline. The most notable result of this crossbreeding was the change of the coat from solid colour to the white with black, orange and lemon markings. Another great breeder who favoured crossbreeding with the foxhound was Eidstone, late 1800s. 
He wrote, The best cross seems to have been with the foxhound because it has given speed, courage, power and perseverance, with the disadvantage, however, of being difficult to train at pointing. We must refer to the dog lover Arkwright for the history of the pointer. English hunters of the 1700s, the time when the pointer starts to have a physiognomy of its own, did not possess a true pointer, but with skilled crossing and intelligent selection, they transformed an existing pointer that came from the continent. According to some people, this was originally from Spain, and Arkwright affirms their contribution in creating the pointer and the hounds in the kennels of the kings of France, Louis XIV and XV, which in turn came from the Italian courts. Other British researchers claim that the breed came from the Portuguese hounds that were imported in England by a Portuguese dealer. The Spanish origin of the pointer, however, seems more probable, and this is Arkwright's own view, as written in his famous essay, even if certainly blood was supplied by the French and Italian hounds. All those who are devoted to this canine masterpiece, which takes part in the most prestigious dog shows in Europe. belongs to the Bracoid group, a short-haired rectilinear breed, a hunting dog of English origin. General characteristics. The general norms are that of a middle-sized dog with the trunk in balance. Height at the withers is equal to the length of the trunk. The height at the withers in the dogs is 55 to 62 centimeters and 54 to 60 centimeters in the bitches. The weight ranges from 20 to 30 kilograms. The head looks as though it is sculpted in marble, heavily chiseled with strong features and expresses fire, energy, intelligence, will and a lively temperament. The head is always carried into the wind. It has sparkling 